All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so it's my special pleasure to introduce Daniel Campo from, here I go, Universita Radec Kralove um, in the Czech Republic. Uh, and he will talk about pathological subleft homeomorphisms in GFT and NE. Please, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Armin. Also, thank you, uh, Philip and Simon. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, invited here. I've I've seen some of the previous uh, uh, presentations. I feel that I'm very good company. So I, I feel very flattered and humbled uh, to be invited to join in uh, such a fantastic uh, seminar. Right. So I want to just show you these papers. Uh, uh, the one which I wrote with uh, Stanislav Hensel and uh, Luigi D'Onofrio. Uh, the, that's the one I would like to focus on. But we'll also be touching on this. Uh, uh, paper which I wrote with uh, Stan Hensel and uh, Villa Tengval. Both of them are to do with uh, sublev homeomorphisms where uh, the Jacobian uh, has very unexpected behavior. So um, and just just to talk a little bit about the about the motivation for that. Right. So um, the Jacobian, obviously, uh, we all know it quite well. Um, you've got some kind of derivative, be it strong be it weak or be it maybe approximative and we're talking about uh, the derivative of the jacobian um, matrix actually at one point i was giving a talk my dad my dad actually came to the talk he's not a mathematician he listens to the whole talk he said like what's the jacobian which 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 is like <laughs> yeah maybe a little bit embarrassing but it, it's actually not such a stupid question which is what i want to say because uh in in the term in terms of smooth maps we know exactly more or less what what the jacobian does the uh, volume element, its relationship to the degree, and, and really what it's saying. When it comes to uh, Sobolev homeomorphisms, we imagine the Jacobian to have exactly that same role. But the point is, not necessarily. And that, 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 that's, that's the whole point of these uh, pathological uh, Sobolev homeomorphisms. But anyway, when we come to diffeomorphisms, we're talking about uh, uh, the volume element and uh, it, obviously has a uh, central role in uh, change of variable formulas uh, we define the topological degree with res uh, by, by the use of the jacobian so it carries some kind of topological information about at least at least in case of diffeomorphisms and um, obviously any sense preserving a diffeomorphism is going to have positive jacobian everywhere so in a sense a an analytical version of sense preservation, i.e. things not being turned inside out, meaning the Jacobian being positive, and a topological uh, version of sense preservation, i.e. let's say the degree of your homeomorphism being one, are the same if, if you have a smooth map, right? And it would be interesting to know in, in terms of, okay, both obviously in terms of geometrical function theory, but also uh, it has applications in nonlinear elasticity. To what extent does this behavior of the Jacobian extend also to Sobolev maps? So just quickly, a uh, sense reversal, if you've got a left hand and a right hand, you, you can't put them on top of each other. Uh, neither can you, you can't rotate them or, or, or translate them on top of each other. There has to be some kind of a, a, a mirroring, sort of an inversion process. So because you'll never uh, deform your right hand into a left hand, uh, we, we kind of imagine that when, when we look at um, elastic bodies and them deforming, we'd like to say, well, this thing shouldn't be able to turn itself inside out. For example, also, also similar, suppose, supposing the room's dark, you're going inside, you want to go to bed, um, you want to put on your, your, your T-shirt for your pajamas, right? You definitely don't want to put your pajama T-shirt on upside down because I mean, you'd have to be really skinny and have your arms sort of halfway down your body. This would be un, uh, uh, uncomfortable. If you put the T-shirt on back to front, this is also, I mean, and, and at the same time, you don't want to turn the light on, right? That would also be uncomfortable to have the T-shirt back, uh, back to front. But you know, that when the t-shirt is the right way around, it has the label on the left-hand side, inside, down by uh, your left, uh, uh, down by your left hip, right? So you feel for the label. It's on the inside of the shirt or the outside of the shirt. It's on the inside if the shirt is the right way around, and if the, but if the shirt is inside out, 
than it's are on the outside, obviously. So then if, if, if the shirt is the right, right way around, you know that the label had to be on the right side. And if the shirt is inside out, it has to be on the, it has to be on oppositely on the right side. So the point is when you turn a shirt inside out, you kind of uh, swap the left hand side with the right hand side, which okay for a shirt is fine, but a, a three dimensional elastic body, we kind of want our, um, our models not to allow this to happen, right? So how do they want to uh, prevent uh, sensor reversal? Well, this typically they'll, they'll prevent the Jacobian uh, being negative, right? So, so basically sending uh, the energy to uh, infinity whenever the Jacobian is non-positive, right? So this, uh, that, that's how uh, sense reversal uh, and the sign of the Jacobian go, starts to blend in with uh, nonlinear elasticity. So, um, Right, and let, let me just say, when I talk about nonlinear elasticity, I've got, uh, let's say, omega as a, a, an elastic body in, in some reference form. Then I've got uh, another uh, domain, uh, delta, which is the deformed body. And I'm looking for the minimizer of all uh, maps which take omega onto delta. Uh, and I'm minimizing uh, an energy which will be some kind of integral of a function of the derivative, typically. And I want, I want my model to be physically relevant. In, su in such a case, I, I don't want the interpenetration of matter. So, so two parts of the body should not be mapped to the same part. So I'm, I essentially want it to be injective. I'm looking at A, having a, um, a derivative. So I want to be Sobolev and B, being injective. So I'm talking about uh, Sobolev homeomorphisms, right? Uh, so uh, just, uh, just skipping back for a second uh, to talk about this Jacobian, right? So a lot of the a lot of what the information which the Jacobian brings to uh, to smooth maps can also be generalized to Sobolev maps, right? So when we have a, a smooth uh, change of variables formula, we can have an area formula, right? Because uh, given that we've got W11 and Lucinan condition, um, however, this the Jacobian term there is in absolute uh, absolute value. You could ask, can if I know that I've got a sense preserving homeomorphism, maybe the absolute value here is unnecessary because the, because the Jacobian has to be positive. We prove that that's not true. You have to take the absolute value of the Jacobian, not, not just the Jacobian itself. Um, yet degree, uh, the degree of a Sobolev map under the right uh, uh, regularity can be expressed using an integral of its Jacobian. Um, uh, right, and so when you go, when you go smooth, it's got to have uh, a sense-preserving diffeomorphism has to have positive Jacobian, and so naturally comes a question posed in 2001 by Hailash: If you have a sum sublet homeomorphism, can, is it possible for its Jacobian to change sign? Right, and un under the right amount of um, uh, regularity, actually they prove it's not. So, so. This, uh, this bound, n has to be greater than uh, the whole part of n half. This, sorry, sorry, this is a paper by Stan Hensel and Jan Mali, right? So if, um, if p is greater than n half, uh, or sorry, the whole part of n half, the integer part of n half, uh, then in fact we see it's not possible. And the argument is, 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 a, is a linking uh, number argument. So you have a homeomorphism and you can imagine two links. So let's talk about uh, 3D. So our two links could be two little uh, links of a chain, yeah. So so two um, two circles which 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 link between each other. Now your homeomorphism can't change the linking number, and you know because you've got enough regularity that you kind of have a derivative on the links. Links a dimension, whole part of n half, and you've got p greater than the whole part of n half. Now, so you've got a derivative. And the derivative will actually tell you the linking number. And uh, well, kind, kind of locally. And the fact that the homeomorphism can't change the linking number means that the derivatives have to be looking in the right direction, uh, to put it simply. Uh, so that, 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 that kind of argument t told them that the, the Jacobian of a W1P homeomorphism uh, can't change sign. Uh, and in fact, in the case that P equals 2 or 3, you've already got the case W11 is also covered by that argument. So, so the borderline case in two and three dimensions is already covered 
you know that the, the Jacobian can't change time. So we're basically interested specifically in dimension four and higher, right? As I was saying a second ago, the sub LF homeomorphisms are the natural choice where we look for our minimizers to the variational model of nonlinear elasticity, right? So even in the context of sub LF homeomorphisms, you can have really, really weird things going on. It was proved in 2001 that you can have a mapping with uh, which is identity on the boundary, but has uh, it's a homeomorphism, uh, but it's got Jacobian zero almost everywhere. So it's possible to squeeze basically everything into nothing. Well, we can imagine that being doing uh, that happening, but actually you're stretching nothing into everything. And then it was also improved on to show that you can even do this it, with a bi sobolev map, uh, at least in dimension three. And given uh, that you don't want the by sub left map to be too irregular. Right. Even more uh, pathological uh, behavior. Uh, well, very, let's, let's say this way. Very pathological behavior of, of, of a homomorphism was shown by uh, Goldstein and Heilash, which is where you have uh, held, a, held a continuous homomorphism. And so essentially, you, you should imagine W everything except one one right so everything below w one one so all, all all the partial uh all the all the fractional uh sub -left spaces below w one one basically um where you have identity on the boundary satisfies the loosen loosening condition but the determinant is negative almost everywhere and then another version they have the determinant minus one almost everywhere i imagine it's trying to imagine this mapping, which is identity on the boundary. So when I start at the left, I end up at the right, going from left to right in the, in the pre-image and in the image, it goes also from the left to right. It also goes uh, uh, the image of a, lie, of a line segment, which starts at the bottom of the square and ends at or the cube and starts and ends at the top of the cube. His image somehow starts at the bottom and also ends at the top. But the whole time he's going backwards. It's some kind, some, kind of like some kind of moonwalk where your, your feet are always going back to front, but you're always going forward, forwards, something like that. So obviously, naturally, the question asks, OK, if you can do this in uh, in for held a continuous ma uh, maps, can can this be constructed also in W11, right, uh, naturally? And obviously, we're talking in dimension four and higher, right? So uh, the first result in this in this direction was uh, Hensel Vena, 2015, uh, where they found a sense-preserving homeomorphism, where the where the Jacobian was negative on a, on, on a set of positive measure, and in fact uh, we were able to improve on this result a few a few years later, where we got um, all the way up to almost being sharp, so p less than uh, the whole part of n half. With, with that borderline case where P equals N half, uh, the whole part of N half, uh, still being unclear. And th th there are some parties which will claim that it's possible uh, to prove that the Jacobian can't change sign. And there are some people who will, who will tell you that maybe you can construct a, a homeomorphism in, in W1 uh, N, N half, which where the Jacobian will change sign. So that, that's, that's definitely still open. Um, but... Uh, Naturally, okay, somehow I, I can say the Jacobian can be negative on a set of positive measure, but can it be negative almost everywhere, right? So why, why would that question be of interest, right? So it's true that these, that these maps of Hensel and Weinar and um, our, our map with Hensel and Tengval, they're examples of sublife homeomorphisms which cannot be approximated by diffeomorphisms. Why would you want to do that? Suppose you want to uh, prove uh, regularity for uh, your uh, variational models of nonlinear elasticity. Then you may want to uh, you may want to um, uh, test your candidate it's against itself essentially in in the variation formulation, for example. But the question is, do you have enough regularity of your candidate for that test to make sense? Typically, uh, in in the proof of uh, in the proof of uh, regularity, you don't. So you approximate with something smooth, something more regular, and then you take that to the limit. So that's something which we want to do here. We want to take our crazy sublevel homeomorphism, 
and approximate it by something smooth. Now, obviously, approximating uh, sublet functions with, with smooth functions is something which is very, uh, well, A, it's standard, but it's incredibly useful uh, for, for getting uh, various different types of results, right? The problem we have is our smooth map has to be relevant to the original uh, vari uh, variational problem. Uh, for it to be relevant, it has to be injective. So we're really talking about pro approximating homeomorphisms with diffeomorphisms. So the question is, is every Sobolev homeomorphism in the closure of diffeomorphisms in the Sobolev space? Right? And these, these maps, which we, which we constructed with Hensel and Vainar, uh, sorry, which Hensel and Vainar and then me with Hensel and Tengval constructed, they're not, right? Um, on the other hand, a lot of the elastic energies would require that the Jacobian doesn't change sign. Okay, our mapping has Jacobian, which does change sign. So yes, it can't be approximated by Sobolev homeomorphisms, but it's automatically a mapping which has infinite energy. So probably not your best contender uh, for the for the minimizer, right? So this leads uh, to a question uh, which was asked by Butazzo based on our, our presentation. Um, can you find a homeomorphism F? whose Jacobian doesn't change sign, uh, but still can't be approximated by diffeomorphisms, right? Now, if I, if I jump back a second ago, we asked a question is, can you require the Jacobian to be negative almost everywhere, right? And actually, I want to say that these two questions uh, are interrelated. So imagine that you've got a, a homeomorphism with negative Jacobian almost everywhere equal to the identity on the boundary. So then you take a reflection of, uh, of F something, let's call it G. Um, now, G on the boundary is equal to a reflection of the identity. The degree of the mapping G has to be minus one. So the degree of any diffeomorphism close to G on the boundary also has to be minus one. So his Jacobian is going to be negative, right? So any diffeomorphic approximation of your function F, oh, oh, sorry, of your function G, which is close to G on the boundary must have infinite energy. So if you can approximate it by uh, diffeomorphisms, you can't approximate definitely in terms of the energy, right? And in fact, um, and in fact, uh, yeah, uh, you can prove that. Okay, imagine that you had a a sequence of diffeomorphisms converging to this function f. Then, up to take a a, a, a subsequence you're going to be converging almost everywhere for the derivative, right? Well, the limit of that derivative is going to be uh, non, uh, depend, depending on which way, if you're taking F or G. If you're taking F, the Jacobian is non, uh, uh, is negative, So, but your approximations are going to have positive Jacobian almost everywhere. So the limit has non-negative Jacobian almost everywhere, but the Jacobian of your F has negative Jacobian almost everywhere, which proves that it's not true that the that the, uh, the the derivative converges almost everywhere, which would have to be true uh, for that uh, for that chosen um, uh, subsequence. So it it proves that it's impossible to approximate such an f uh, homeomorphism by diffeomorphisms. Okay, right. And now this is our result that we do actually manage to prove that uh, for f in w one one uh, there exists a homeomorphism. Uh, with identity on the boundary and uh, negative Jacobian almost everywhere. In fact, uh, we do get some higher integrability. Right? The integrability which you'd want in this case uh, for dimension four or five would be uh, p less than two. But actually, we're, we're sharply below two. Um, and the, que okay, the question is why? Uh, the, the mapping is actually very complicated. Believe it or not, it's actually quite a complicated map. And there's some kind of, um, by, by Lipschitz extension of a map, and it's not entirely clear what that map's doing. So if you could understand exactly what that map, doing, that map is doing or do a by hand uh, construction, then maybe you could have a chance of, of making sure that certain large derivatives don't hit other large derivatives when you, when you go for the composition. This is a composition of maps. We build it in stages. And 
a priori, it's not clear why uh, a big derivative would not hit another big der derivative, in which case we can't guarantee the optimal uh, integrability. But if you did a, a by hand um, construction, then maybe for a start, perhaps you could get uh, this map to be also by Sobolev, maybe. I mean, we see no reason why you couldn't. But with our construction, there are certain parts which we need to squeeze a lot so that they don't cause a problem. And that leads to the uh, inverse having uh, infinite uh, infinite norm in, or like not being part of W11. Right. Uh, and yeah, that, 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 would be ha that would be the way you'd have to go with that. So um, let, let me give you a key idea here concerning uh, the construction of these homeomorphisms. Now, if you're Heilash and Goldstein, what you'd want to do is take these two uh, cubes in the construction of a counter set and move them around each other so that one's on top of the other, basically. This is kind of going to kind of eventually in the limit by lots of twisting mean that all of the cubes are now in the opposite order on a vertical line than what they were before, giving you an approximate a derivative at, um, at uh, density points of the counter set uh, where, where basically your, your, your Jacobian is like minus one. The problem is all of this twisting around each other, it requires too much energy. So all of all of if you take any the image of any vertical line, it's so twisted that it must have infinite length. And that's that uh, any line through the counter set that is. So so essentially uh, what you end up with is uh, not in uh, W11. So the idea uh, which 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 was applied uh, to get the result is basically what you have to do on any counter set and any lines parallel to cornered axis going through the counter set is is, is essentially create a reflection in 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 a hyperplane um, so that the entire counter set and the lines going through the counter set are reflected. Right. So how do you do that? First up. You take your fat counter set and squeeze it into a into a skinny counter set. So you can imagine lines going to lines, and this is just a, a typical um, uh, counter step function times a counter step function, right? Like the 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 the, the, um, uh, the product of counter set functions, right? In each dimension. So lines going to lines. You just squeeze it. That that gives you uh, like a lot more space. And the way to imagine this is uh, that all the lines are being squeezed so close to each other that you should imagine your counter set and the lines through your counter set as basically um, the vertices and and the uh, and the side or sides I mean the edges of a four-dimensional cube. It's not entirely easy to imagine what the projection of a four-dimensional cube onto a three-dimensional hyperplane looks like. Um, but if you can, what you'll realize is the project, if you choose to do a projection in, in, in a good angle, and there's lots of good angles, uh, but what you'll have is you'll have two cubes which get projected down onto a hyperplane, and they'll be interlocking between each other, and there'll be sort of diagonal lines which will go through different uh, through two corresponding vertices of, of, of the two cubes. And then all of those lines, which have which have come from the projection of your, um, let's say, net of the of this four-dimensional cube down into three dimensions, they'll all be missing each other. In other words, and and you you can come to this conclusion by a simple uh, argument of um, uh, Hausdorff dimension, that it's possible to find a direction such that when you do the projection of this counter set and lines parallel to the counter set onto a hyperplane that this projection is injective on that set. Right. What to do with that information? You construct something which I called uh, a spaghetti strand map. So spaghetti strand map works this way. Um, you divide up the entire space into um, the hyperplane and a strand which uh, which uh, goes through uh, the hyperplane and goes out exactly in the direction of this direction which you've chosen on which the projection is injected. That uh, that strand of spaghetti intersects uh, your uh, your set which you want to project out exact well at most in one place. 
if you're on a strand which intersects the uh, yeah which is coming out of the projection of this set you know exactly how much you have to move this strand of spaghetti right so so you just like taking that bit of space and pulling it all down so that uh, the, these lines which we see here um, on the left they're all being shifted down onto the hyperplane right do some clever constructions and you find that the, the, the function on the hyperplane, which tells you how much you're, you're going to be shifting stuff, is in fact a Lipschitz function, and you can extend it Lipschitz, right? But we don't have any more control than that, just a Lipschitz extension. Now reverse the direction of, uh, of your good direction and send it back upwards. And what you've done is you've actually turned the whole thing upside down, right? So this squeezing is, is, is this is like a, a Lipschitz map, and this is, in fact, actually, just a, literally a bi Lipschitz map. You can prove that that this this twisting is a bi Lipschitz map, right? And by shifting some parts in the middle and at the edges, stretch, stretching and squeezing, you can actually do it so you get identity on the boundary, right? That's that's the point of this cube that uh, this, this slide that you, when you stretch at some parts and squeeze at other parts and move in the middle, uh, you actually don't move the edge of the cube, and so you've got identity on the boundary. Fine, very nice. Okay, so that means that we're actually able to construct a, homeo uh, uh, a homeomorphism, sublife homeomorphism. Let's say satisfy. Uh, let's say uh, it's in fact uh, locally uh, uh, by Lipschitz outside of the Cantor set. It's locally by Lipschitz. So, with co as far as composition goes, not a problem. And on the on that Cantor set, the, the, the Jacobian has uh, is negative, and that Cantor set has a set is a set of positive measure, right? And you've got identity on the boundary. Now, what you could do is apply your map F1, make a tiny little scaled copy of F1, and put it at different places where your map is basically linear anyway, uh, but your Jacobian is still uh, positive, and a apply uh, like an iteration by composition argument. So make lots of tiny little copies all over the place of F1. And when you apply those, you turn inside out even more of the set. Once you've done that, repeat and repeat until you get some uh, limit map where the Jacobian is negative almost everywhere. Right, nice idea doesn't work. Point is, um, whenever you've got a counter set, which basically you can imagine like a cube inside a cube, to get it up, going upside down, you're going to have to go up, down, and up again, right? So it turns out that the length of this thing is, uh, of e any such line is 1 plus 2R, because the size of this cube, you're going through it twice, basically. Well, before I was going through it once, now I'm going through it three times, so I've added 2R two, two to the length. How much do you, how much of the set do you turn inside out? Uh, uh, well, this much uh, R cubed, and you're using th this many this amount of lines. So the problem is, the the minimal L1 norm of the derivative is one plus two R uh, to, to the power four, and the size of the set eliminated is R to the power four. Okay, right? Because we're in dimension four right now. So when you start iterating, you 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 have to go to infinity. So the problem is this idea, just, just simple iteration by uh, composition is not good enough. So you have to come up with something more clever. In essence, you have to be able to invert more of the set without adding any extra de derivative, right? Okay. But essentially this picture which we have is, is, is not bad. I mean, that, that's really, this picture which we have here is, that's really what's happening next to the Cantor set. I'm going past it, through it, in the opposite direction, and past it again. Um, okay, let's start doing this. Let's let's take this map where I send uh, the Cantor set into its inverted self and put it next to each other, tile it next to each other many many times. Okay, well, the the lines which you see going horizontal, they're just sent onto lines which are going horizontal, right? And they don't move very much. So if I keep them going straight the whole way through, I mean, there I've got one direction where I'm going around the counter set, but I've got three directions where I'm basically not doing anything. 
So theoretically, it should be possible uh, to say, okay, I've only got one bad direction. So then I can make um, a cube where I've got lots of these strips where uh, inside the dark part here, I'm, I'm turning everything, more or less everything, inside out. But I've got three directions where I'm, where I'm really doing very nice. Fill up a cube like that. And then call that your map F1, right? So, so we've done something a little bit more clever. Okay, so when I'm going in the directions X1, X2, X3, I've only added like this little bit, which you can see at the end, which is this swapping over. I mean, these tubes, I can make them really thin. So I'm only adding some tiny delta in those directions. Those directions are real happy. And I'm basically filling up the entire uh, cube up to some up up to some tiny measure delta. Okay, so this this counter set basically takes up everything except a, 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 a set of measure delta. In the other direction, the size of the derivative is big, but it's fixed. It's just some number uh, C42. I call it 42 because well, why not? And What's interesting is the size of that derivative. I mean, I'm just going around the counter set. If I make the counter set much bigger, I don't really increase that size, uh, that constant C42. So for a fixed C42, I can make delta as small as I like, right? So choose delta so that delta times C42 is small, something like this. Now what you do is you take your original map, the gray part in the middle, that's where I've already turned the stuff inside out. There I leave it. I take the, all the places all around and I say, okay, I already have one bad direction. Okay, let's make sure that now what was sent onto a bad direction is now gonna be sent into a good direction. So yes, I'm not gonna be stretching anymore in that direction. It's gonna be hitting something which has derivative, which is here like one plus delta, right? So by a clever um, rotation, I make sure that the big derivative hits now a small derivative. What's the size of uh, the other derivatives? Well, they can be estimated, uh, where have we got it? Um, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm skipping, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, yeah, that, that's what I said. Yeah, so we're not, in, uh, yeah, that's what I said. Okay, yeah, and now we estimate the size of the derivatives outside of uh, this new done set. So the done set is where, 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 the, where the Jacobian is already negative, right? And, okay, the size of the derivative is most like C42, but on a set of, of major delta, so it's small. Yeah, and, and then the other, the other, the other, the other derivatives we uh, estimate by like worst case scenario. So it's it's something big uh, meeting something which is not so big on a small set. So it's all small. So you add all these estimates where you've got something big times something small, and you see that uh, actually I in fact the integral of the derivative which I'm estimating just by simply adding up all the, its components is not so big. Right. Then you make these copies, which you're which you're iterating by really really small. So, in fact, um, each each time you compose, you can actually calculate as you sum it up, and, and, and the two integrals become um, independent of each other. And you can calculate that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's not go into details. Just calculations give that each time when you iterate, because you're iterating by something which is which has such a small um, integral outside of the set where the Jacobian is negative, or in other words, the Jacobian becomes negative on such a large set now that uh, the integral over the rest of it is actually very small. So actually I'm not changing very much each time I, I go to my next iteration, which means essentially that I get to a uh, Cauchy sequence, right? Uh, and then I, then I prove that this, this has a limit. Uh, its limit has a negative Jacobian almost everywhere, right? And hence, hence we get, hence we get to our conclusion that we have a map with uh, with negative Jacobian almost everywhere. So, uh, yeah, that, that's that's the publishing of, of these of these uh, articles. 
and uh, that, that's more or less what I want to say. So, uh, Armin, uh, over to you for a second. Uh, you have more minutes if you want. But if not, yes. Um, right. What would you like to hear more of? Um, I, I mean, the, the motivation is, I think, has been gone through. But like, I mean, I could go into this construction in more detail, but it's like it's somewhat involved. Try us. OK, OK. So. So like what, what the most surprising thing about uh, like this, this construction is off is obviously where the where the uh, magic happens is is this map here, right? So you can imagine taking a canter set and squeezing it in many directions, lines going to lines. What becomes hard is is imagining a a, a function or a mapping which uh, takes lines parallel to coordinate axes through a canter set and turns them upside down, right? Um, basically. It, the mapping is by Sobolev, uh, sorry, by Lipschitz, but is also equal to a reflection in um, a plane perpendicular to X4. Right. On Well, its restriction onto the canter set is equal to a reflection. Right. So, I mean, you could say that your by Sobolev is something like your uh, diffeomorphism. Right, it's 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 kind of kind of something similar there. So your diffeomorphism or your by by Sobolev, uh, your by Lipschitz map cannot have negative Jacobian on a set of positive measure, right? But here I've taken I've squeezed it down so much that actually the set has got zero measure. It's some some tiny canter set, and there uh, by okay, and maybe we don't really, uh, or maybe we find it very hard to imagine because it's only in dimension four and higher. That actually I can I can uh, take these uh, these lines and basically I'm rotating them round past each other, which obviously in three dimensions they'd have to hit each other, but I've got a fourth dimension where I can unlink them and pass them past each other basically. But right, um, yeah. So it's it's it's, it's literally a, a question of. Looking at the projection of the canter set and lines parallel to cornered axis through the canter set, looking at his projection onto onto a hyperplane. The projection we choose is um, okay. We've got a hyperplane parallel to x4. Uh, sorry, perpendicular to x4. And okay, let let's try and say it simply. I have a vertex of of my cube. I have to project him down onto the hyperplane in such a direction that uh, the ray which goes through the uh, from, from the hyperplane through this uh, uh, vertex mustn't touch any of uh, any of the other sides uh, of or the edges of, of the cube right so if we if we If you try and do that in two dimensions, right, from three dimensions to two dimensions, you're obviously going to fail, right? So just imagine uh, getting something which looks like a cube. Shine the light on that cube. Uh, so, I, I mean, literally, you've only got like little sticks which are representing all the edges of the cube. Shine light onto that like, little structure from any direction. And when you look on the table, you'll see certain edges of, the, of your cube uh, have shadows which are overlapping. Right now, imagine uh, that you've got something similar, but you're projecting it onto three dimensions. Well, you can imagine drawing a cube in space and then slightly shifting uh, another version of that cube down to the side and to the back and then joining up its corresponding um, vertices so that they miss each other. And that's exactly the, what our projection is doing here. Right. So then. Um, so then, yes, the point is we can extend that. Okay, we can extend that projection as a by Lipschitz map. That that that's crucial, and it's exactly this idea of okay, basically I'm moving points on that set along the rays until they get down to uh, to the hyperplane, and move the rest of the ray exactly the same way as I've moved uh, the points in in my little net construction. So some of it's going up, some of it's going down, 
and so it all ends up in the hyperplane, right? Then basically what, what, what you do is you reverse the direction. So everything which has gone down is going to keep on going down and everything which has come up is going to keep on going up. So basically what happens is you've got part of the canter set here, part of the canter set here, and, and they, they, they go past each other by the side, right? Which, which because, because we're going onto a three-dimensional hyperplane rather than a two-dimensional hyperplane, you can actually do, right? So um, obviously, if there's any more questions, maybe you've heard enough about that. Nobody wants to hear about that anymore. Uh, but that, that, that's kind of this, the most uh, involved part of the construction of these maps, right? So I clap.